Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, begun to look for opportunities to not do PowerPoints. So I'm not going to do a PowerPoint today. Thank you. I, I, I thought y'all would appreciate a break. Um, and I have a standard presentation on all the wonderful things that the City of Austin and Austin Energy is doing. I'm going to briefly address that. But Debbie sent some questions to me that uh, she wanted to address. I looked at the questions and I thought this is much more interesting than my PowerPoint. So I'm going to spend most of my time on that. Uh, first of all, uh, the City of Austin and Austin Energy, I think, is generally regarded, and I think rightly so, as one of the more progressive municipal utilities in the country. And we have had several accomplishments over the years. We're probably the only utility that actually replaced a coal plant with energy conservation. We took a coal plant, thank you, we took a coal plant out of our long range generation plan back in the early 80s, and we substituted 500 megawatts of energy conservation worked quite well. Uh, I see Paul Robbins here. He was one of the leaders in that effort. Uh, we now are uh, set a new goal of an additional 700 megawatts to uh, replace another power plant. We were one of the first uh, cities to start the green building programs in the early 90s. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab has recognized us as leaders in renewable energy voluntary green power programs for the last five years. Uh, as uh, Debbie mentioned, we started a program a few years ago to promote plug-in hybrids, and that's our vehicle out in the, uh, the lobby, uh, converted Prius to promote the um, uh, Plug-in Partners National Campaign. We recently established an Austin Climate Protection Plan to try to consolidate all these into a more unified plan structure. It has goals like 30% renewables by 2020, uh, 700 megawatts of conservation that I mentioned, 100 megawatts of solar. Uh, we had a press conference yesterday morning uh, announcing the, the uh, first step in our zero energy compatible homes initiative. Uh, we are changing the building codes and the first building code change was passed uh, yesterday so that incrementally by 2015 all single family homes built in Austin, Texas will be zero energy compatible homes. They will be so energy efficient, about 65% more efficient than today's homes, that if you put solar on the roof, their energy consumption and energy generation should net out to zero over the course of a year. Thank you. We also, uh, we also have included a 75% reduction in energy efficiency for commercial buildings. We have a community plan uh, that we're developing. We're committed to getting all of our city fleets off of uh, petroleum by 2020. Uh, and um, uh, all city buildings are going to be carbon neutral by year after next. We're bringing in enough wind power from West Texas to power our municipal buildings 100% off renewable energy. And we have several other initiatives going on. So we're doing a lot in Austin, and, and we're proud of that. But uh, I've been dealing with this for 25, 30 years now, and um, uh, there are a lot of problems emerging, and I don't think the problems are being talked about that much, and we need to address them head on. Uh, and the questions that Debbie gave to me were, is an excellent point to, to start. Uh, the first question she asked was, how does the utility address energy constraints, manage risk, prepare the public for the challenge? Uh, utilities, and it's not just utilities, governments as well, utilities have to become much more open than they are today. Uh, the, f the planning necessary for new power plants and transmission and distribution system and on-site distributed generation is much more complex than it used to be. And I'm in charge of strategic planning for our utility, and most utilities go back and they look at all the options and they try to balance them. They come up with the recommendation, they give it to the public, and the public says, no, 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 we don't want this kind of power plant or that kind of power plant. You should do everything through efficiency, do everything through renewables and so forth. It's not that simple. And frankly, for the utility's benefit, as well as the public's benefit, that process be needs to become much more open. And we're going to launch a, uh, a project next year, a massive public participation plan, where we put out data that, frankly, has been considered proprietary in most utilities. Um, but I, I don't think it's any secret now to the challenges that we face and what the options are. 
And frankly, we need to share that complexity of actually matching up megawatt hours in your load demand with the, the capacity factors of wind and solar and so forth. And, and get the public involved more in that actual decision-making process. And, and I think everyone will see that it's more complicated than we normally think. Uh, educate on the trade-offs. We need to be frank, the rates are going up. And uh, our utility hadn't had a rate increase for 13 years. And that's great, and conservation's had a lot to do with that, but that's changing. Uh, the price of electricity is going to go up, and it's going to go up substantially everywhere. Uh, the other question she asked was, how, what do policymakers need to do uh, and need to know to assist the utility in reaching its goals? Well, uh, there's a couple of pet peeves I have here, I guess. And I've been an elected official, by the way. I was on the Austin City Council for a couple of terms, and I became cured of that. Um, and uh, uh, so I understand what you need to do to promise and so forth and to stay in elective office. But we're running into some real problems. And one of them is, frankly, it's one upmanship among the different government entities. And I've been in the rooms and helped set the goals for Austin and so forth. And what will happen is the mayor of Portland will come out and say, you know, we're going to achieve 20% by 2015 and something. And the mayor of Seattle, Greg Nichols, will look at it and say, well, that's great, but we're going to achieve 25% by 2012. And my mayor looks at it and said, by golly, we're going to 100% next year. <laughs> Um, and it's happening all over the country, and, and frankly, the elected officials need to understand that the uh, federal and state and local laws do not uh, supersede the laws of physics. And, well, <laughs> and, and we're running into real supply constraints. And the supply constraints are running across the board because people are getting it now. We've got to go to renewables. We've got to go to energy efficiency. That's great. But have you tried to get a wind turbine lately? Have you, you know, what's the backlog for solar sales? Uh, what's the backlog for train sets for delivering coal to the plants? If you're for nuclear, there aren't enough nuclear engineers to build all the plants that's being discussed. Across every sector of the energy economy that I see, there are severe su supply constraints. Um, we replaced a coal plant with energy efficiency. That's great. It took us 20 years to put in enough energy efficiency to replace that coal plant. You don't do it in four or five years. And so we need to be much more realistic in the goals that we're setting. And we need to prioritize. And this is my latest kick. Um, we are, we're trying to do everything at once, and we're trying to do the same thing in every part of the country, and that's not the way to do it. We're not prioritizing our clean energy choices. Uh, let me give some examples. We're all for changing out lighting, right? Complex fluorescent love should, should replace incandescence. Uh, we're for conventional hybrids, they're better in gas mileage. We're for plug-in hybrids, we're promoting them from Austin. Well, look at a couple of markets. Uh, let's say Seattle and Cleveland. Why are we changing out light bulbs in Seattle? I know it's good for the consumer and it lowers the bills, and I know that uh, it creates more renewable energy and so forth. It's not saving any carbon. Seattle's running on hydro. And plug-in hybrids are good in all markets, even in, in coal markets, but they're much better where there's a renewable energy resource. The plug-in hybrids ought to be going to Seattle, not to Cleveland. Conventional hybrids are best everywhere because uh, we're all running on petroleum and diesel. The priorities are different for different situations, different entities, different regions, depending on your renewable energy inventory, depending on what your local fuel mix is, so depending on your supply train. Uh, I, 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 I could go on and on there. But we're not taking the time to prioritize, and the difference in stabilizing the atmosphere and the difference in, in stabilizing the carbon concentration in the atmosphere could be decades or centuries based on how we prioritize our clean energy choices. I was asked the question of uh, what rules do, uh, what roles do incentives play, what works and what doesn't work. Incentives play a large role. 
if they're combined correctly with uh, regulation. Essentially, you want to uh, move the regulatory standard up, whether it's a building code or an appliance efficiency standard up to a certain level. You want to have an incentive program that uh, uh, pays the cost differential to go 10 or 15 percent higher than that. When the market transforms and moves to that, then you move your regulation up, you move your incentive up again, you stair step up uh, the, the economy and in a region and and that's essentially how you use uh, incentives in combination with the right regulatory approaches there's a lots of good things uh, things we've learned over time that doesn't work and um, I'm not going to spend time going into all those uh, what's the most significant challenge for the utility uh, industry uh, the cost of new power plants is staggering I know we're debating clean coal versus nuclear uh, and when you can't meet everything from efficiency and renewables, and of course efficiency and renewables should be the first options, no question about that, uh, but given some time frames um, and given the carbon restraints, I mean, everything that we're doing in Austin um, isn't quite meeting our new load growth. We haven't done anything to reduce our carbon footprint yet of all the numbers that I gave you earlier uh, from our existing power plants. And again, if you try to do that in a 10-year time frame, you're going to run into real supply issues across the board, getting the energy efficiency and the renewables in place in a short amount of time. Um, last question I was asked was, how do you see the plug-in hybrid effort going forward? I'm very optimistic on that. I, I think the uh, original equipment manufacturers, the automakers, have really made the decision. And uh, from my discussions and in a less public forums with uh, GM and Toyota and others, uh, I think you're going to see two, three, four models of plug-in hybrids on the streets within two, three years. Um, I agree with what was said earlier in terms of what would be the conventional time frame for the penetration of market for uh, these drive trains and so forth, um, and the analysis of the emissions and the cost trade-off and so forth. I think the answer of how fast we will convert to electrifying the transportation system is, is obviously dependent on the subject of this conference, peak oil. If you don't have the supply of petroleum, then you're, all these analyses go out the window. It's like uh, in World War II, uh, when we converted the entire automotive industry over to building tanks and, and jeeps and so forth, in the course of a year, uh, there wasn't anybody talking to the president about the penetration time for the new drivetrain for the tanks. You know, there wasn't a choice. And if your choice of petroleum and diesel is taken away, I think that the electrification of the system will take place very rapidly. There's really only two alternatives in terms of fueling infrastructure. It's biofuels and electrification, and uh, the biofuels have significant food versus fuel issues. Uh, I, I, but the timing of it really will de depend on when peak oil hits. So those are my thoughts this morning. I appreciate questions. Thank you very much.